Hello and welcome back to episode two of You Are Not Your Diagnosis. This episode is a deep dive into the topic of not being your diagnosis. Why is it that we often become identified by our diagnosis? We'll talk about how not to be your diagnosis and ultimately why it's important for you not to identify with your diagnosis. So let's get started talking about this important topic for your healing process. In my own experience, I want to start there with my story with this. When I was diagnosed with leukemia back in 2004, I remember that that felt like it became kind of the forefront of my identity very quickly. So I went from hearing that diagnosis pronounced in the hospital room by the doctor to returning home to where I lived and feeling like all the parts of me that had been there before, so the Lynn who was a graduate student and a daughter and a friend and somebody who loved to dance and all of these things about me who were part of who I was before the diagnosis felt like they really faded very quickly into the background. And instead, I was left with this one big thing as my identity. I was either a cancer patient or the girl with leukemia. Like those were kind of the two ways that I started in some ways to see myself, even though I didn't really want to, and the ways that I felt like others started to see me. I remember in terms of my relationships with family and friends, especially, after they heard the news, every conversation began with kind of like, oh, how are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, what's going on? How was the doctor's appointment? Like all of, all of the conversations came back to this theme and this topic of my health. And ultimately, I didn't really want that to be the only thing that I seemed to get um, attention for or people talking to me about, but yet I didn't really know how to say, hey, this is kind of too much for me to talk about all the time. And I didn't know that it was okay to set some boundaries for myself around this particular topic. I didn't know it was okay to say, you know, hey, today I just would like to talk about some other stuff. I'd like to know how you're doing or to maybe give people a quick update and then say, okay, let's, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something fun in life. Because I felt at that point, and maybe you can relate to this, that I had to answer all of the questions because people were concerned and they were caring and they wanted to know and they wanted to support me. And so ultimately I felt like I had to, you know, just go with the flow and answer all of the questions that I was being asked and the topics that I was being asked. I know now that it's really important to set some boundaries around those because it's exhausting to feel like that's the only thing people want to talk about. That's the only topic that seems to be discussed around you. Um, it's very, in some ways, disempowering. It comes from a place where people are really trying to, you know, show care and concern, and that's wonderful. But ultimately, it felt like when the only topic that was discussed with me was my health, I felt like it shrunk my identity further and further into this one thing, into me being the sick person. And of course, nobody else in the group, in the family, in the friend group, you know, was going through anything that was big enough to match that. So it was like, oh, it's all about, you know, Lynn and how she's doing and, and her health. Let's talk about that. So if you can relate to that, know that you're not alone, that it's, it's a challenging struggle because you, you appreciate the concern, right, that others are expressing for you, but at the same time, it's often too much and it leads us back into staying stuck and just focusing on our problems and how we're feeling and the symptoms and ultimately that's really not helpful or empowering for us. So to talk more about this topic of first, how did I feel like I became identified with my diagnosis and how do I see that often in others and clients and other people that I know who are dealing with a diagnosis? Well, as I kind of alluded to in my story, I feel like I initially began to just see that as kind of the main thing in my life because I was sick and didn't feel well and was exhausted and had symptoms. First of all, it was harder to engage with life in the same way. So perhaps all of the activities that I enjoyed, 
I pulled back from, I didn't do as much or maybe at all. And the main thing, especially in those first few months was lots of doctor's appointments, you know, everything really was focused on my health. And that, again, compounded to make me feel like, you know, I was just a sick person. I was the cancer patient, the girl with leukemia. And yet deep inside, I knew that I didn't want that for myself. It felt very challenging to feel so identified by that particular thing. There were parts of me that were crying out, you know, we're still here. And ultimately that's part of this message that I want to share is that you must remember that you are the same person that you were before that diagnosis was pronounced, was given to you, was, you know, found and discovered by the doctors. You are ultimately the same person now, today, that you were the day before you heard that news. You're still, you know, a daughter or a son or a wife or a husband, a mother, a father, a friend, like all of those parts of you, you know, or a brilliant business person, or all of those pieces of who you were before you got sick are still there. Yes, some of them may feel like they're a little bit further away, like maybe the things you enjoy or your ability to do the work that you really love because you don't feel well, feel like they get pushed a bit to the background. But remembering for yourself that those pieces of who you were the day before you knew this news or the day before you get, got sick, they're still there. They may be a little bit buried or muted, but reclaiming for yourself those parts of yourselves that are buried or hidden or feel like they're overshadowed by whatever diagnosis that you're currently living with. It's tremendously powerful to really reclaim that for ourselves because it helps us not to see that this particular health issue, it's not the one thing that's sitting right there in the center of our world, kind of blocking everything else out. We are still all of the things that we were before. They may be muted and we may have to do some work to reclaim them and that's important because for your well-being, for your mental sanity, for your health and your recovery, it's important not to see yourself in that way constantly. If you're constantly walking around identifying yourself as a sick person, well, our thoughts are part of what create our reality. So if you're constantly saying, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick, I don't feel good, I don't feel good, I don't feel good, ultimately the way that the world works and the way that energy works, again, Einstein even said this, what we focus on expands. So if we're focusing on being sick and the symptoms and that is our identity and that is who we are, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon it's like all those other parts of us do feel like they're gone because this other thing has gotten so big, it takes up the whole space of the room. So really becoming very mindful for yourself of how you're thinking about yourself. How are you identifying? Ultimately, the diagnosis is not who you are. You are a human being. You are so many other things, it's not who you are. It's something you're currently experiencing in your reality. It's a challenge you're currently facing, yes, but it's not who you are. You are more than that. You are not the diagnosis. So that first part that we're just kind of working through here is how are you seeing yourself? So take a long look. I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time and maybe even journal about how are you thinking about yourself? How are you identifying yourself? What thoughts go through your head on a regular basis? What do you tell yourself about your health and about your diagnosis? And if those things are a lot of kind of negative reinforcing beliefs, you know, I'm sick, I'm miserable, um, my body's failing me, this diagnosis is ruining my life, Again, the energy of that is just going to expand and expand and expand and multiply. And so we want to start to shift out of that and start creating space for other things. Because when we give space for possibilities that we may not be able to 
fully believe are possible now, but maybe we have a glimmer of hope that you could feel a little bit better. We're also creating the space for that to start to become our reality. So now let's shift into talking a little bit about how others sometimes can make us are identified by our diagnosis. So again, I shared a little bit about that in my own story of, you know, everyone made making topics basically about me. Like the first question I always was getting was, you know, how are you feeling? What's going on today? Um, how was your latest doctor's appointment? You probably get some of those things from certain people if you haven't established boundaries as well. So one of the things that I talk about around this particular piece in my book is about how others' projections, and that's kind of a psychological term, others' projections of what their experience might be like if they were in your shoes, they, you know, they picture that and they project it onto you. And so therefore, they're also starting to see you through a filter of what they think it would be like to live with your current condition which makes it even more painful, right? Because they're not seeing you. They're not seeing who you are. They're seeing you through how they think they would be feeling. So you can notice projections kind of when somebody's thinking something about a circumstance and like, if, if that was me, ugh, you know, it would be really hard when people say, oh, you know, you must hurt all the time or you must be really depressed or, you know, all of those things that people say you must be, that's often coming from their perceived um, experience of what it would be like to be in your shoes. They're projecting something that if they were going through what you're going through, if they dealt with chronic pain, then of course they would feel completely depressed all of the time and they wouldn't want to get out of bed and, you know, all of those things. So I think sometimes it's helpful to notice that, first of all, that people can sometimes project that onto you and then they're not even really with you in your present experience like you may be trying to tell them hey I'm having a good day today and I feel really good and they're like oh you must be really depressed you know you must oh yeah it must be hard to get out of bed in the morning and that again is just so isolating to have somebody and they're you know probably doing it because they think they're caring and they're in a concerned state with you, but they're not really seeing or hearing you where you are at. It's your lived experience of what it's like to deal with the particular issue you're dealing with, and yet they're kind of missing out on that because they're coming from the place of, oh, if I had cancer, um, I would be this way or I would be that way. So sometimes you know, just noticing that and maybe even calling someone back like, no, actually, you know, I'm doing well today. If that's what you want to express to somebody, you know, no, just knowing you may not want to call someone out and say, you know, you're projecting something onto me. You might, but just knowing that they might be coming from a place where they're not even seeing you. And then the second thing that I want to talk about in regards to kind of how others identify us with our diagnosis is that it's okay to start to set boundaries for yourself around talking about your health. This is something that I did not have a clue of in my early 20s, in my mid-20s, that it was okay to say, I appreciate your concern and I appreciate that you want to know how I'm feeling today but I don't really feel like talking about it today, thank you. Or, you know, to share a little bit of information, like, you know, my doctor's appointment went really well. Now, how about we talk about other things? If that's what you want, you can steer the conversation in different directions, and it's okay. It's okay to change the topic. It's okay to have boundaries about what you want to share, who you want to share it with, certain information you may want to share with certain people. And certain information may not be appropriate for certain, you know, colleagues or not close friends. And you may want to just shift out of that topic. And a polite way of saying that, again, is just, you know, I appreciate your concern about me, but I'd really rather talk about other things today. So you're acknowledging them and you're acknowledging that they're coming from hopefully a good place, but you're also setting a boundary for yourself to take care of yourself. Because ultimately, if the, all the conversations that they want to have are about, you know, 
your health and your treatment and your symptoms and all of that, again, that leads to you feeling so identified with that diagnosis and with your problems and your symptoms. And it leads to them not seeing you in the entirety of you. So perhaps, you know, somebody that you had a shared interest with, a hobby, a, a thing that you used to do together, if you're physically able to do that again, resuming that, if not, maybe even just asking them about, hey, how's, you know, the rowing team doing or how is the gardening club going if you can't go, like coming back to common interests and engaging with life from that place because then it's about the relationship and the connection that you shared with those people, not just about your health. Um, one of the biggest gifts in having a conversation with my friend Annabelle Fisher, who was a wonderful woman who passed away from stage four cancer several months ago, she talked about, we, we had an interview together um, in the spring, and she shared that oftentimes she had this experience of people just kind of wanting to make conversations about her and how she was doing and, you know, what was going on with her. And she really, again, reinforced how important it was to say, you know, no, I'd love to hear about how your life is going too. Because this is, again, the big thing that happens is when something scary and overwhelming happens for us in our lives when we're not well, like it feels like that's the only topic that for some reason feels okay for people to talk about. And so you miss out on hearing about, you know, your friend's children or what's happening with their new business or their vacations or whatever they would share with you normally. So I would encourage you to step out of that feeling like you can't say no to talking about your health and start opening up doors to conversations that you still would like to have. Relate to people in the way that you always have because ultimately you are still that same person. They may kind of see you as, you know, oh, she's sick and delicate and oh, poor her, which was a big thing for me as I really hated that feeling that people were perhaps having pity for me. That was almost like the worst thing for me personally that someone could have is like poor Lynn. I didn't want to be poor Lynn. So if you experience that in relationships, and again, often that comes from, you know, people trying to be kind, but poor Lynn or poor whoever, poor you is not empowering. And by taking back control in the conversations and leading the conversations in different directions, you're reclaiming your whole self in the relationship. You're reclaiming all of the connections you have, all of the interests, all the commonalities, and you're stepping out of just being you, the person who's sick all of the time. So a third aspect of this not being our diagnosis that I really wanted to address in this particular issue as well is really about the words that we start to use when we talk about our health because this again relates to how we're identifying with our diagnosis. So one of the biggest things that I've noticed over the past 15 years now is the tendency when we talk about health issues, we say my blank, my diagnosis. So originally for me, my cancer, my leukemia, um, or I have blank, so I have leukemia, I have fibromyalgia. And those words, my and I have, are very powerful. I mean, think of the, the energy behind my, it's you're saying ownership over something. Do you really want to own this? <laughs> forever and ever and ever like you know my run the flag up the flagpole identity this is my claim it's a habit and this is a tricky one I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it's so tricky to get rid of this particular thing but when I started to become aware of the using and the common usage of those words I now kind of cringe either when I say that, which happens sometimes because it's kind of a hard habit to break, or when I hear other people saying it, because it's claiming those things. When you say, I have, you're claiming ownership again over something. Again, we don't want ownership over these things. So the tricky thing that I realized in thinking about this topic when I was writing my book is there's not an easy replacement for the way of just referring to our health conditions. 
in this way, this offhanded, you know, my, my fibromyalgia, my lupus, my rheumatoid arthritis, whatever it is, how do you get around that and not have a long sentence? Or how do you get around saying I have? And ultimately, I haven't come up with one conclusive answer. I've gotten several ideas of things, but they don't fall off the tongue as easily as the defaults that have been there for years and, and that are kind of the way everybody seems to talk about it. Some of the ideas I've come up with are I'm currently living with blank, but I believe in the healing potential of my body. But again, that's a long sentence and it doesn't always come into conversation easily or I'm currently healing from blank. And that, again, brings some energy back to the fact that your body is working to heal itself. You may not see that, um, but I think I alluded to this topic a little bit in the beginning, in episode one, that our bodies really do want to heal themselves, that that is their natural state. And I'll probably have another episode on that here shortly, on how our bodies really are designed to heal and they're always trying to heal. So when we use the phrase, you know, I'm currently healing from, we're holding that space for the body to heal. You may not see that on a day-to-day -day basis. You may, if you're engaging in doing some beautiful, profound healing work, and I see that with my clients, they are currently healing from something. Their symptoms are less, you know, they have less fatigue, less pain, less whatever factors, you know, they're off of more medications, so their bodies are healing. But even if you're not in that space yet, at least hold the space for possibility. Hold the space that your body is currently trying to heal from whatever you're currently living with. So think about the words that you use and just the power that they have and start to just be curious about how could you talk about your health differently. Those are the two big ones that I like to talk about, but there are so many other ways that we talk about our health that have a profound impact in just creating the reality that we're creating for ourselves. And ultimately the question is, is that the reality that you want to create for yourself? Or is that the reality that you think is just predestined for you because of what you've been told about chronic illness under the branch of Western medicine? That chronic illness is just, it's never going to go away. It's never going to get better. So I, why bother holding the space for possibility? I always want to hold space for possibility because that's where the power is. That's where the magic is. When we open up the space from the fixed known of I'm sick and miserable and I have all these symptoms to what if my body could heal, we're opening the door for something to start to happen. The other area, too, that feels really important to speak about in terms of this language piece is how people still identify years later, especially this is common kind of in the cancer survivor community, to say years and years later, I am a cancer survivor. And ultimately, this is one that's kind of hard to, to speak about because, yes, you're claiming survivorship, and that's uh, on one level, it's beautiful. I'm grateful that these people are still here and alive and that they survived through the illness. But when you keep saying, I'm a cancer survivor, and you keep saying, uh, you know, cancer survivor over and over and over, you're keeping that energy to some level active in your field. Like, that's something that happened in your past. So perhaps exploring a way to leave it in the past. It's not that it didn't happen for you. It's not that it's not part of your life experience, but to keep on saying time and time again, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, it keeps that energy alive. And we don't want to bring that back to ourselves. None, no one who's been through that journey, I know, would want to bring that back to themselves. So it's a process, again, of just looking at the language that you're using and what sort of impact that is having on creating your reality. Because, again, words that we use, they have tremendous, tremendous power. So to wrap up this episode, I really want to just focus a little bit more on why is it so important? Why is this the second topic that I wanted to cover? And why, why ultimately is the show titled this and my book titled this? Because ultimately, in my experience and what I've observed, 
the people who most identify with their health issue, with their diagnosis, it's so much harder to heal. And I don't want that for anyone. I want you to have the full potential and possibility there for you to heal. But if you're walking around with that, like your label and your name tag and your badge of honor or however it comes out for you, however that's part of your reality, it's hard for that to shift. So, you know, if you constantly am saying, I have this, I have this, I have this, this is who I am, you know, I, I, my this, my this, and you really believe it, because some of those word pieces, yes, they have power, but if you're doing it somewhat unconsciously and just out of habit, it's not as, as impactful as if that's who you really see yourself as. So if you really see yourself as whatever that diagnosis that you've been given is, and that's who you are from now on, you know, you are fibromyalgia, you are an, your autoimmune disease, you are chronic pain, you are whatever that is. Like if you're walking around with that, you're creating more of that. And you're blocking the opportunity for that not to be part of your reality. So ultimately that's closing off the possibility of something else. Because if that's who you are and who you identify as, how can you become a fully healed person? That's, that's who you're seeing yourself as. So you it can't step beyond it and into something new because that is so ingrained for you that that is like a core of who you are. And it's not. It's not the core of who you are. It's something you're currently experiencing in your life, yes. It may be a current challenge in your life, yes. but at it's at your essence. It's not who you are as a human being. So to close this episode, my suggestion is to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what is, how do you identify yourself? Are you identifying yourself as that diagnosis? Or how do you identify yourself? How do you want to identify yourself? How do you, at a fundamental level, how do you see yourself? And how do you want to see yourself? You want to see yourself as whole, healed, complete, just a, a person who's growing and evolving as a human being? Like, I can't answer that because it's going to be individual for you. I'm giving you some ideas. At a fundamental level, who do you want to be? Who do you want to identify yourself as? And certainly, I would hope that it wouldn't be identifying yourself with your current experience, with the experience that your physical body is going through, the experience sometimes that your mental and emotional body is going through. Those are experiences, but they're not your identity. So please, I, I urge you to take a little bit of time at the end of this episode or when you have time in the next day or so to just reflect on that, whether that be writing it on paper or spending a little bit of time thinking about it. How do I want to identify myself? How am I currently identifying myself? You may need to do a little bit of looking in the mirror in terms of am I identifying myself as my diagnosis? And then how do I want to identify myself? And I'd be curious what your answers are. So I hope this was a valuable episode for you and raised some new thoughts about how to think about your health how to think about chronic illness and a diagnosis and how not to be your diagnosis. So until next time, I'm wishing you health and healing and new possibilities.